Okay, mm. so should be okay. Um, I'm here with Kenneth Dominique. Um, can you please say and spell your name? Kenneth G. Dominique. First name is K E N N E T H. Middle initial name George. G E O R G E. Dominique. D O M I N I Q U E. Great. And um, we're here at 506 North Cherry and I'm interviewing you today for SACAM. My name is Mark Cousy and that's M-A-R-K-K-U-S-E-Y. And um, the date today is January 30th, 2020. And uh, okay, Kenneth, um, how, would you, uh, how would you describe your ethnic background? Oh, uh, mixture. I, I really can't say, but I was raised in New Orleans, so uh, I guess you'd say a uh, mixture of French, Spanish, we're known as Creoles, and uh, well, I reckon that's all. Okay. And um, what what is your religion, if any? Catholic. Catholic. Um, were, were, were you married? Yes, married by the church. We got married three different times. We got married in in Laredo, Mexico, by the judge. Then we got married by the priests, the Catholic Church over there. Then we were remarried at Holy Redeemer Church in San Antonio. Okay. And the wife said we weren't married. Oh. <laughs> And did you have any children? No children. Okay. Uh, can you give me a little information about your formal education? Well, my formal education was in uh, New Orleans at, from the grammar school uh, to a high school in San Antonio. And then I went one semester to a Southern University in right outside of... Um, Oh heck, I can't think of a little town, but it's in the, in in uh, Louisiana, and only one semester I came home for Christmas and stayed there. Okay. Didn't go back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, um, what was your primary occupation uh, after after your formal ed education? My primary was working for my dad is behind the bar. At that time, he promote one night stand bands at uh, two different places, at the Library Auditorium, which is now known as um, Helium, not Helium, uh, uh, mm, 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 mm. well, Carver. Yeah, Carver Culture Center, and then the Municipal Auditorium, which is now at Tobin Hill. And those were the two places he would promote the one night bands. And I'd be behind a portable bar serving Cokes, Seven Ups, and Ice. Okay. Um, and what, what age did you retire from all of your work? I retired in uh, 1988 from Kelly Air Force Base. Okay. Um, I, I was remiss to ask you, what, um, what, what year were you born? I was born in 1928. Okay. September the 3rd. So that makes you about 91. 91. Okay. We're going to go a little bit into your, your childhood and your youth. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe your family life when you were growing up? Maybe, maybe some of your, from your earliest memories. Yeah, my earliest memories was I was living with my grandmother and grandfather in New Orleans, and that's on my mother's side. Because Dad was traveling, he and Mother, he had an orchestra, and he travels 
uh, all over the United States, Mexico, <coughs> and Canada with a band. So I was with them for until Dad decided to settle down here when he gave his band up in 1937. So I moved down here with him and Mother, my grandfather and my grandmother. I see. So your grandparents were taking care of you yes. when your uh, when Dad was traveling, and then your mother would travel with your father. She was to she traveled with him all over, everywhere he went. She was there with him on a bus. <clears throat> wow! And uh, you're saying that the type of uh, work that they did, your your mother would actually help your father. It sounds like, but your father was a musician, correct? Yeah, but I don't know how much help she would do. Um, she wasn't, it wasn't in the music field. She was just a companion and traveled with him and took care of more or less like the business at point. And that's, that, that's it. I mean, she made it a, a deal to uh, stick with him the whole time. Yeah, that's a lot, yeah. taking care of the business. Many end. years, yes. many years. That's, um, can you talk about, going back to your family or sticking with your family, can you talk about some of the special days or events or family traditions that you can recall from your childhood? Yes, I can. I uh, know uh, right before one Christmas, I was coming out of school, public school, for Lena C. Jones in, in uh, New Orleans. And I was coming from upstairs. They had wooden stairs you come down. And I was kept late after school. So I'm okay to heck when I get home. So I decide I want to hurt them. And on those steps, they had those little finishing nails with no head on it. And over time, the wood wore a little bit, so the nails protruded a little bit. Well, I tripped on one. I fell on the, on my knee on the other one and put a deep gash in it. And uh, that put me down for a pretty good while. Um, my legs swollen, got infected. And uh, Christmas, I had been wanting a bicycle. I called it a big bicycle because I had a little two-wheel bicycle and they told me it was a sidewalk bicycle so I don't go on the street. So for Christmas, I wanted a big bicycle. And that Christmas, I got a bicycle, and my knee was still pretty bad shape, but I rode a bicycle anyhow. And riding it, it helped because the infection came out on the side. And so that made me feel a lot better. And I had my my grown-up bicycle. I could go in the street with it then. Uh -huh. And uh, Christmas was pretty good with uh, my grandmother and grandfather. Of course, my grandfather was the, the nicest person you ever, ever would know. He had, I had never seen him get angry. He had a melatonin voice and, and his real calm. And he worked in Corpus Christi as a tinsmith. Well, that was his job in New Orleans. He'd make the gutters and hang the gutters. And at that time, you'd put the gutters up, and then when you connect together, you use a soldering gun. And this is what he would do. And those gutters would, would not come down. They were up there to stay. And I, I helped, helped him with that some a little, not much, but that, that muriatic acid they put on the thing where they join. If you got on your skin, it burned like heck. Mm -hmm. Well, I got burned a couple of times, but uh, it, it, I just decided I went through with it, and then he lived in Carver's because he was working down on the base, the naval base, and he'd come to San Antonio every now and then. And that time he came down and he was going to go back and we tried to keep him from going back to Congress. No, he wanted to go back. And 
he there was an accident and he was hurt in that accident. The car flipped over several times and and so he was in the cast from his feet all the way to his chest. Wow. They didn't put no small cast. He broke his pelvis and uh he he couldn't do anything. He was just in the bed, but he was here in San Antonio with mother and dad, and we lived on Lombrana Street at the time. But then he overcome that. He got over that, and went back to New Orleans. He, uh, he didn't work no more for the for the Navy. I don't know what happened, how, why, how he quit, but. That was the end of his work deal. And going back to holidays, um, mm -hmm. are there any other holidays that you can remember besides Christmas that uh, your family celebrated that were really special to you? Uh, like which holidays uh, did you celebrate or any other kind of family traditions that you can remember growing up? Well, we celebrate most of the, the holidays that have a standard holiday. We uh, celebrated that, and in uh, New Orleans, where I was with my grandmother and grandfather, uh, in that area, in that block alone, most of the folks were kinfolks. There's uh, my grandfather on my mother's side, his brother and family live right across the street in New Orleans. And that one block was mostly relatives. And then around the corners, you had people that were so-called relatives because it was a knitted family deal. And uh, we uh, they would always introduce as your aunt, your uncle. We didn't know whether they really was or not, but we were so close that they were our aunts and uncles and cousins and whatnot. Sure. <clears throat> That's, uh, that must have been great to have so many people that were related. To, it, uh, it was, and we did a lot of things together. My grandmother, she used to, she was a midwife. She delivered me on Miro Street in New Orleans. And the lady next door was nosy and whatnot. She hollered out her window, I know it's a boy. <laughs> yeah. And then the lady, and then my aunt, on my mother's side, not really an aunt, but uh, my grandmother raised her as a young girl because her mother passed away. So she was kin, she was an aunt, and she's 98 now. She carried me as a baby. So I'll never forget her, da her date, you know, her birthdays. And uh, she's still living. 98, just a spry white hair. Her hair is completely white. Amazing. Now, she lost her husband. He passed away. Her youngest daughter, who she was living with after she retired, and she worked out at Kelly Air Force Base with the rest of the family that worked out there. And she retired from there. And uh, she moved back to New Orleans. She was living in San Antonio for a while. And so uh, the whole family was involved in working at Kelly. Dad, mother, dad, sister, his older brother, uh, my aunt, uh, my dad's youngest brother, me, and who else? Dead, of course. Lots of carpooling. Yeah, carpooling, right. <laughs> you better believe it. Mother um, would mark the cars where antennas, she put something on the antennas so you could find the car. Oh, like a little tennis ball on yeah, the uh, something. On the antenna. Something, whatever she could put it on there, she'd put it there. Because there was no markings, you know, no section or nothing at you. Exactly. With that marked place. Can we, can we uh, talk about, um, continue on talking about your childhood and your youth and um, how about sports? Did you play any sports or kind of uh, other activities outside of school? Not, yes, I did. Outside of school I played softball. Uh, 
I played hardball for a while and I got hit in the lip and I said no more hardball. So uh, with the bass team, I played softball, fast pitch, and then you had slow pitch. Well, I say that's slow pitch, anybody can hit that, but that's a lie. You can't just any, go up there and hit that. You, you do better hitting a fast pitch ball. And uh, I went to grammar school on the west side at uh, St. Catharines. Okay. One building, two story, so you had all the classes in there. And, uh, and then I had to play a piano duet with a girl. And at, at that time, girls were like uh, yucky, you know. Sure. Uh, I played the piano, I plunk, plunk, plunk. When I finished, I got off the stage very quick. That was one part. Then the other part, I was on, in a play. I can't think of the name of the play, but I was supposed to be an angel mama. And they had my head with, her, with one of them red bandanas and a long dress and an apron. And I'm talking to this chicken because I'm cooking it. And there's a line I had to say, you sure is a fine young bird and a fine young catch, uh, fine young chase you gave me for I caught you. <laughs> <laughs> I will never forget that. Oh, man. So you... So you <laughs> and then the sports. I played with the, with the team off the base. And we had a sponsor. Uh, a, a bar sponsored us. And when we finished playing, we'd all end up there and we'd order some beer. And the owner sometime would throw in like a case of beer and put it on the table. And the ladies would all get together and they'd communicate with each other separate from us. We'd sit at these tables and reminisce about the game and how it went this and that. And, so this was the outside team I played with. Okay. And uh, had the, we had uniforms. The sponsor had uh, T-shirts with their names on it. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed those sports. And then when I went to high school, I played basketball, played football at St. Peter Claver's Academy which on Nolan and Live Oak. It's now Healy Murphy. That's a high school. I f finished there, high school. I was also in different plays there. And we used to put on the plays at the library, which is Carver Culture Center. This is where we put on. And I never did know my lines completely until the last minute. But I knew everybody else's line. I don't know how that worked. And so I was in different plays at the school. And I, I enjoyed acting. I was a ham, you know. Enjoyed that. It was good for me because I put everything in it because I liked it. Dad, the same thing. He was a lady here. Um, she used to produce different things like that, plays on the stage, and Dad was uh, one of the actors involved in it. She put on different, uh, uh, I had a name the, a while back, I remember the name, but I can't even think of it now. My memory kind of gets a little fuzzy there, and I can't remember certain names. And uh, Dad was a, a, he was a good actor too. And he played Deep Out of Roots with one of the plays, and I can remember that. And in one of them, he was a professor. In another play, uh, Mrs. Hemmings was the lady in charge of that. Okay. Um, this, so your father was in plays as well, as you're talking about. There were plays. Uh, Actors, yeah, live plays, yeah. That's when he was here in San Antonio. Okay. Because he gave his band up in 1937. I see. And he made San Antonio his home base. 
because he started here <clears throat> playing with Troy Floyd band at 17 years of age and by him playing here I guess he thought this would be a good place to settle down and after he gave his band up in 37 later on there I moved down here with him mother talked me into coming going back because in 40 in 47 we had that uh, epidemic of polio broke out so I went back to New Orleans with my grandmother and grandfather and stayed there until 1950 no 1940 because they had opened this nightclub in 1942 I'm telling you it's over with now Oh, that was just my bad. After he settled on there, he opened a nightclub here on on Iowa and Pine. And uh, he still played his trumpet every now and then with the house band, or when they put the floor show on, or when the, he'd have these bands that would appear as a one night stand band. Uh, he, and they'd end up at a keyhole. So this is how I got to meet a lot of the people in the musical field. Okay. Could we go back yeah. to that and, <clears throat> well, because I'm very interested in that, and I know lots of other people will be, but, um, so, so we talked about your school experience. Oh, how would you say that your school experience is different from school as you know it today? Well, for one thing, we, we were not integrated. We had, we were in a sense, we had one person that was not, you know, of the black race or whatever. And they used to have girls, boarders, that live across the street in that two building that they own. And we were taught by the sisters. And uh, the, the school was very different than it is now because it's integrated. And then at that time, we we uh when we knew where we were supposed to be or how we were supposed to act and because we knew we couldn't go to certain places couldn't do certain things but then in the field of uh sports when i was there i played basketball i played football the first year we started football mm -hmm. and that was across from the that's on uh right there where the expressway in Nolan is. That's where the uh, the field was that we used to practice in. Mm -hmm. The St. Peter Clavers Academy is still in operation, but it's on a larger scale now. So and segregation, it's a larger scale. What, what else do you think is different about what's going on now as opposed to when you were going to school? The kids are sort of out of hand because they, 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 they're not brought up to show elderly the correct uh, deal on 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 uh, communicating, and they because they feel as though everybody owes them everything. They don't know they're supposed to go out and get it like we did, because it, it, it's a lot easier now due to the fact that this modern technique technology is in, it's a lot easier to communicate and to get different jobs. Uh, thinking back on your, on your school years, mm -hmm. what important social or historical events were, were going on at that time that, that you can remember? Well, at that time, uh, I was going to school also working on this particular building where Dad was going to open this nightclub called a Keyhole. It was originally a theater. And so in the evenings when I get out of school, I'd go over there and work on the floor because we had to bring the floor up from the stage to finish to nothing. And this is how I spent most of my time. I didn't attend a lot of parties or nothing. It was just, Nature could busy working. I'm living with my parents. I figure 
I'm supposed to do certain things. This is why I was why I was with them, living with them. And I did that after school, on holidays, on the weekends. So I worked all my life. I worked at that young kid, 17 years old, behind the bar. And he, when he opened the keyhole in 1942, <clears throat> I was behind the bar then. Well, you lived during the era of segregation. Can you can you speak about that? Definitely. I can speak about it because I lived it. I knew all about it. I knew you couldn't go certain places. You couldn't do certain things. There were movies that you couldn't go to. Uh, the one you could go to that was down here is on uh, Commerce Street, the Cameo Theater, right there on Sycamore and Commerce. We could go there. That was the Black Theater. And uh, you'd go to the, um, the Majestic, but you had to go through the back door and the elevator and go to the very top floor in the bird's nest. Bird's nest. And then there was another one. Um, boop, boop, what the heck? There's two other movies you could go to, but they were segregated. And then also, speaking of the movies, you had drive-in theaters here. They were also integrated. Can you feature that? You're in an automobile, but you're still integrated. You have to go to one side, the other ones go to the other side. And I, I knew I was supposed to go where the blacks go. And so I drove there one, one night with this friend of mine from New Orleans. And they told me, well, I couldn't go in on the colored side. I had to go on the white side. I said, no, I belong on this side. You got to go on the other side. I kept saying, look, I know where I'm supposed to go. This is where I'm supposed to go. So I went anyhow. So you sit in the car, you don't communicate unless you go to the smack bar, then you're back in automobile. So why why was the lady um, trying to get you to go to one line as opposed well, to? She she thought I was white. Okay. Well, we've always been taken, you know, from white. Dad was the white man with the black band, okay. and when he traveled, that's what he was known as. So what they yeah. say back then that you would pass. So pass for white. Pass for white. Yeah. Um, so were there restaurants and eating places for black people? Yep, you had a few places. You had a Chinese place over here on Commerce, they call it, and right on the corner of Commerce and, oh, hell, what the hell is the name? Right by there where the expressway is now. <clears throat> and then you had another place, uh, where you could go well, Conway Street was the main place where blacks had businesses, and well, and it was, of course that was the segregated part, and that's where they had their businesses, and that's how they made their living. But then when they built this, the uh, expressway, it cut the people off right there at the expressway, it cut Conway off. So a lot of people didn't know how to get down here on this part of town. So consequently, a lot of the businesses had to close up. Wow. Um, how did you get to your schools? Like, could you walk or did you take a bus or? A walk sometime from the west side to the school over here on the east side. I lived on the Rhino Street then. How far is that? Oh, that's way on the west side. And I don't know how how long it how long it would take me to come, but that's the transportation that I would had my feet. I see. Until later on, and then a buddy of mine, he had a 1932 Model B Ford. Well, we ride in it sometime. Okay. And then I had my own 36 Ford later on. So this is how I would get back and forth. I didn't ride no bus. 
You didn't ride a bus, and mm-hmm. um, so you were saying that that this, of course you're living during during segregation. You're you're going to um, um, high school that was segregated as well, and mm-hmm. um, and who taught? Who were the teachers? Uh, there were the nuns. The nuns from the Holy Family. Holy Holy Family. I think it's Holy Holy Family. Okay. Uh, oh. All the teachers were the sisters. They lived right there in, in the, on the compound at the school, St. Peter Cleaver. Okay. And uh, Sister Mary Boniface was instrumental too in a lot of desegregation. She fought with Mr. Crane, the fellow who had bought Budweiser. She fought with him to eliminate some of the integration. And Dad's nightclub was in the first integrated club in San Antonio. And that happened because the people requested that. It wasn't Dad doing it. People asked him, Don, my, well, my dad, they called him Don, his name, Don Albert Dominique. They called him, they said, Don, say, how come you integrated the place? They say, I didn't integrate it, the people did. They wanted to because it was good entertainment. Sure. He he had a nightclub called the Keyhole. Keyhole nightclub. And um, this is where you worked. Right. Uh, I'd like to ask you about your life after high school. Uh, where did you live? And and uh, did you move around? We lived so many different places in San Antonio, mostly on the east side. But uh, when I was working at the Keyhole, we were I was uh, um, living on Lombrano Street, and the Keyhole was on the east side. Lombrano was on the west side, and then. Uh, uh, most of the time is spent from the keyhole to Lombrana, from Lombrana to the keyhole. So I didn't have much uh, growing up f- uh, relationship because I was busy working all the time. So you lived in different spots in San Antonio, but you never moved to another city besides San Antonio after no. you moved here from New Orleans. No, I didn't. This is it. Um, can you tell me about about your marriage? Like where where you met? Uh, what her name was? Uh-huh. What sort of engagement or what the wedding was like? That kind of well, stuff. Well, I married a girl from San Antonio. She was Hispanic, and we would go together. I'd meet her. We'd meet. And I couldn't go to her house. I'd pick her up on the corner and drop her off there when, you know. And uh, this went on for a while, then they got married. When we got married, we had to go to Laredo to get married. That's why I say we got married three times. We got married by the church, the courthouse over there, so they could get, everybody got a little pill. Then the, the church, the priest wanted us to give him some money for announcing the wedding three days. We, we didn't, we didn't, he, he didn't do nothing for three days. We over there, we got married, we left here from San Antonio, went to Laredo. They had to type up all the paperwork in Spanish. And then after that, we, when we come back to that night, I had to go to work at the Keyhole. Janie was at home with mother and dad. Janie was my wife's, her last name was Garcia. And she loved music. She loved jazz too. uh, We were married for 59 years and nine months and no children. And we both loved kids, but we just didn't have any. We tried everything in the book except the fertilization or whatever that was new. And she wasn't interested in that. She wanted to make sure she didn't have her own kids. So time went on and it just got too late. 
to nothing happened. But the neighbors' kids, wow, were over here all the time. We had neighbors on the left, the right, across the street, and uh, we uh, enjoyed each other company. We enjoyed a lot of things together. She, what I liked, she liked too. She used to like music. We went to New Orleans. She was doing the second line in New Orleans. And when Dad was down there, he played with Pete Fountain, the jazz player clarinet. Janie was in that second line going down the street doing a, a dance with the umbrella. And uh, we've been in this house since 1954. She and I, now she's passed away, it's been 11 years. And everything in the house is still her, you know. You, you marry her all that time and you accumulate this and you accumulate that. And, well, since she couldn't have her own kids, she went into the foster parenting deal. Well, we had quite a few kids that went through the house and that was a hard thing to do to let them leave. And the last one we had, she was two years old, Amy, and she called Janie Mommy. She was the smartest two-year-old we've ever seen. She could talk good. She changed her clothes. She would come into the den and ask, how do I look, Mommy? My wife would tell her, oh, you look beautiful. She'd go back in the bedroom, change her clothes, come back out again. But uh, Janie kind of messed up. She rose. She called her people and told her we couldn't take care of Amy anymore uh, because we were going out of town. And when I found out about it, I was really mad because that little girl was something else. But uh, Janie called him and told him she, we couldn't take care of him anymore because we were going out of town for vacation. And I told him, what? Why are you turning back in? I said, you could have asked for a letter of authorization. She would go with us on a vacation. But it was too late to do anything. They, they wouldn't come back, you know, bring her back. And uh, she took a lot of pictures of Amy and put them in a book and sent them with Amy, but I don't think it got to her. I think they destroyed evidence because they didn't want a lot of the kids to know, you know, the people that they were living with for some reason or another. And then we went as a young lady was going to have this baby and she didn't want it. And this couple told us about it. so. She lived in Crystal City, and they told us about this young girl. And when she came down, we found a place for her to stay. And we'd take food there and the clothing and take her to the doctor, our doctor, and he'd check her out and everything. And then she was going to have the baby by midwife. That was the way she was supposed to have the baby. Then on the last minute they changed it and said they couldn't do it, she'd have to go to the hospital. So I said, well, okay, I checked into the hospital and I told her, well, you know, you're supposed to turn the baby over to her. She said, yes, you know. So she had the baby, a little girl. I picked up from the hospital and gave it to Janie in the, in the, front, of, the front of the car. We dropped the young lady off, came to the house. We had a lot of stuff already, you know, gotten accumulated for the baby. And about, uh, I guess about two weeks or two and a half weeks, we got a call from some lawyer, said she wanted the baby back. Boy, my wife was tore up. She had to call her sister to come and change the baby because she couldn't touch the baby then. But anyhow, it wasn't that the reason, it wasn't how they wanted the baby, is the people where she was staying. Because if they got the baby to stay with her, they'd get more money, or they'd get money from the state. So uh, 
we went back and forth over that, and we went over to Dad's house when she was supposed to pick the baby up, and I told him that she had to have a police escort. So we went over to Dad's house, called a lawyer to find out if it was legal, and he said, yeah, it was legal that they could pick her up. And so we come back here, and you know, knocked on the door, the police was standing, I told her she needed a police escort. So. She was there and the police were there too. And so I asked the young lady, I said, why are you doing this to us? I said, we've treated you nice and everything. I said, why are you doing this? She couldn't answer, she wouldn't answer. She had her head down. And so I told the police, well, they're gonna have to come back, bring some clothes for the baby because we're not gonna turn her loose with this clothes that we have. So it went, went to the automobile, the lady took off the coat, and he was a little nippy that day, to put the baby in that, and took the baby. And that was it. I haven't seen or heard from her since. Yeah, well that's... <clears throat> then that's when my wife, we went into foster parenting, and I think she had about seven kids went through, through here. Mm -hmm. Going back to your um, to your work, what would you consider your main field of employment was? I was uh, worked out of the Kelly. I started in 1954, and uh, I worked up up the ladder. When I first started there, I was a a packer, one twenty one an hour. And then uh, I moved up. Then I got I got authors I got letters in the mail saying that I qualify for different positions. And one of them was was uh, an inspector. So I wanted to go see about it, but I didn't know where and who and how. And his supervisor didn't want me to leave, so he would wouldn't give me a, a release to go. So then I thought, well, I'm gonna have to forget that. So I got a letter again with the same title. I said, well, I'm going one way or the other. I'm gonna find out how I get. So I told him, I want to go see about this new job. I went for an interview, and the or Mr. Robinson said, yeah, I said, I'd like for you to wait for me. Uh, this is a, called a stock tracer. And he said, as soon as you can. So I had to get a release from another supervisor. So I was working there under Mr. Robinson's stock tracer. Then I got another letter of promotion saying that I was promoted to a warehouse equipment inspector. This is all at Kelly Field? All at Kelly Air Force Base. Okay. So that I retired as a material and equipment inspector in 88, 1988. 1988. Which was a pretty good raise from the, when I first started off. So can you describe a, like a typical day of, in your life during those working years? No. Get up in the morning. Like, and the old old tradition, they were working at the keyhole, build, working at the keyhole, building that floor up, and working in the keyhole, still doing the one night deals for the bands when they come in, and it ended up at the keyhole after. Well, at that time, it was, it was called B O Y B, bring your own bottle, no mixed drinks. We served the ice, the cokes, the Seven Ups, water, whatever champagne, we'd ice down champagne, and we served beer. Those were the hardest things, the champagne and the beer. We didn't have no liquor license. And uh, I got off one night from the keyhole. They told me I could go. I didn't know where to go. I got in the car, I drove up Iowa <laughs> Street to the Brown. I turned around in my 36 Ford and coasted back to the keyhole 
And that's where I stayed in the cable. <laughs> How about when you were working at Kelly Field? What was a, like a typical day like? You get up in the morning, like at what time? Well, uh, 6.30, I had to be at work at 6.30. So I was up pretty early. And I'd get catnap at work every, t every time I had like a break or something. I get a cat nap, and there was a, a cafe outside the base. I used to go there at lunchtime and drink a beer, so then you know I'd eat my lunch first. So then I drink the beer and go back to work. And uh, that went on the whole time. I can see that place just as vivid, and I haven't been in that area. And I don't know if it's still in existence, any part of it around there. I don't know. Um, what did you, um, what did you uh, value most about what you did for a living? Family life, living with my family. My mother, my dad, his sister lived with us also on the brand. The youngest brother, the oldest brother lives in the hotel down here. But uh, that's the family. And on Saturdays we would clean the keyhole, we'd move all the tables and chairs to one side, sweep it and dry them up, then move them back on the other side. And then we'd go to St. Mary's Church at 5 o'clock in the morning. We'd stay up, you know, working around until time to go to church. And then when we was in the church, we kept nodding. Our head would go, we'd go to sleep, nod forward, backwards. And when we finished, when we finished the service, we'd go to the keyhole. And everybody had their chance to fix breakfast. And that's how I learned to make biscuits. Dad was the biscuit champ. He knew how to make them biscuits. They were light as feathers. Man, and we couldn't wait for breakfast. Then we'd go to sleep. Wow, you guys spent all your time together. Um, and it sounds like you like to cook. What was what would an example be of something that you would cook for breakfast? Uh, the only thing I'd make like boiled uh, scrambled eggs or eggs over easy, biscuit, ham, bacon, things of this nature, fast, fast stuff. That's what most of us had for breakfast. And, uh, cause it was fast, easy. Sure. And we got to go to sleep. <laughs> so you guys spent a lot of time together as a family. Did you have any, uh, Family traditions, besides while well, you fix breakfast, that's one tr tradition. Did you have any sayings that uh, would be like inside joke? Everybody knew, hey, that's just the Dominique family, they'd say that. Oh, well, I don't know about that, but... Uh, uh, oh, at the keyhole, when, when uh, we were all working at the keyhole on the Brandon Street, got a knock on the door and this fellow went around to the side and so dad went out the back door he said can I help you I said well we're from the FBI we're looking for that white lady which is dad's sister that lived with a black family dad said okay just a minute I'll get her so he went inside he come back with a shotgun and dad probably would have shot him you know he was you don't take that bullshit. I mean, he, he believed in integration a long time back. And uh, he said, when when he come out with that shotgun, he said, you better get the hell off my goddamn property or you're going, you're going, they're going to have to drag you off. Man, it took off like scared rabbits. We didn't have no more problem with that. A white lady with a black family She's light, dad's light, mother's light, I'm light, dad's brother's light. The oldest brother was the only one that was dog. Uh -huh. Maurice, the oldest. But uh, that was 
one experience of Lumbrana and, and the, the educational part of <laughs> doing the thing. Uh, they just love to fish. Well, I love to fish too. And uh, we go fishing a lot. Dad, what, the only hunting he did was ducks and birds. He didn't hunt any big game, but I end up being a big game hunter. I enjoyed the fishing and stuff, but when I was there fishing, when he had the boat, I had to do all the work. I had to launch the boat, move the trailer in the truck, car, go get in the boat, take off, then put the anchor out. There's already fishing. Governor, come on, they're biting. He called me governor. My dad never called me son. Why did he call you governor? I don't know why. What well, governor and count? There was just two main words for everybody: governor and count. And uh, uh, I did the work on the boat. I mean, I said so then when we f he's fishing, he said, "Come on, governor, they bite." I said, "Dad, the boat isn't stable yet. I'm trying to put the anchor out to keep the boat from floating." And then he said, give me this, give me some water, give me a sandwich, give me, give me, give me. I said, oh, sh Then we got to take the boat out of the water, got to secure it, make sure it's, it's correct on the trailer. And we drive back here to San Antonio. But then I had the, the job of cleaning the boat, washing it out, running the motor, getting rid of this, the salt water in it. Dad's in there, and he went in there, and he uh, toot his horn for a little while, and he go to sleep. <laughs> and, but I'm out there working on the boat. He kept you busy. I worked always on the boats. I worked on every boat Dad had. First one was a Thompson hull. It's wood. It, no, not a Thompson. This was a 14-footer plywood. Pretty boat. It wasn't for fishing, but that's what Dad used it for. It was a show boat, more or less. And having that anchor and putting it on the top deck and it start chipping, you know, the paint and whatnot. And so finally, then he he traded it in. He bought this Thompson hull with a 75 horsepower Johnson, and uh, he used that one for a pretty good while. And when he traded that one in, he got a, one of them tri hose spit hole you can walk through the windshield. And that's the last one he had. And I raffled that off on a Super Bowl game and got the money I wanted for it. I didn't get Jew down. Because if you try to sell it all, they're going to find faults. This way, whatever, you had, a, I made up a, a square of blocks cost so much a square, paid so much a quarter, I paid two fifty the first, two fifty the second, two fifty the third, and on the end I paid the, the boat and everything, trail everything went. And uh, this fellow who won it, he had a boat, it was like that, but it's smaller. And he won it. I almost won it. Do you remember what uh, year that was or who was playing in the Super Bowl? Uh -uh. I don't remember that. Okay. Uh, when you're thinking back on your working life, mm -hmm. what uh, important social or historic events were taking place at the time? And, and how did they affect uh, you personally, you and your family? Mm -hmm. The only thing I can say was like when the rodeo come to town, a lot of people from the rodeo would go to the Kehoe. Uh, these different plays you were, you could attend to. Uh, just socializing as much as you could, where I didn't socialize that much, due to the fact that I, I keep saying work, work, work. Well, I did. I work, work, work. And I think. I have to tell her, I said, I, I contribute the longevity to working all my life. 
as a kid. As a kid, I was a kid. I was behind the bar, seventeen years old as a kid, you know. So, and before that, I worked at four years awning in Venetian blind in New Orleans when I was with my grandmother and grandfather. And uh, Dad would get on the phone and call me every morning. He'd be a little kind of tipsy. He called, right, Governor, I need you over here. Uh, they're stealing me blind, so and so. Dad, I told you, I was not coming back to San Antonio. I have a job. I got engaged in New Orleans. And he called every morning. Finally, he put mother on the phone. You know, your mothers can make you do all kinds of And she said, he told me, he said, well, Governor, if you come down, he said, I'll pay you the salary you're making now. Plus, when I divide the money at the end of the week with a partner, I'll give you half of mine. I said, Dad, I don't want to come down and I told you that. So mother got on and she said, well, why don't you try it? And if you don't like it, you know, you go back. So I end up back here. And that was it. That's where I finally stayed here. I didn't go back. I go back and visit, but that's about it. Um, how, coming, coming back full circle and we're looking at like today and we're living in San Antonio and you're living in San Antonio on Cherry Street. Uh, it's called Dignity Hill. Mm -hmm. um, how is it for you and to live in this community? I have no problem. I don't have no more neighbors now. When I did have neighbors, their kids turned out to be our kids in a sense. They were always over here, either left, right across the street. But now there's no one in either house. The people that were there passed away. But across the street is the firehouse number one, the big one, where all the calls go and then they dispatch them from there. So that, in a sense, is a security for me. If I ever need it, they walk right across the street. Like I've fallen a couple of times and got in touch with them and they're over here in a flash. But you were, um, you were, you were born in 1928. So you were born right before the Great Depression, mm -hmm. which is when the 30s, and um, and after that, uh, World War Two was from 19 in the 40s, basically, mm -hmm. and then and then you experienced civil rights, the civil rights movement in the 60s, yeah. and uh, all that trauma. Um, and of course, segregation has been happening ever since you were born up oh, until yeah, the 60s. Uh, you've, you've seen the moon landing, you've seen the invention of all these different things. Thinking back on your entire life, uh, what important social or historic events, uh, or just basically anything that you can think of, had, had a real great impact, or even the greatest impact? Well, the greatest impact was where they, they eliminate this uh, signs in these places of business colored and white on the drinking fountains the restroom so you could go most any way you wanted it mostly I say not all the place mm -hmm. but that was one of the main things you could venture out and explore different things where you, it wasn't possible before because you were limited what you could do and couldn't do Oh well, I'll take a shot. <laughs> so, so when when segregation started to happen, um, you said it was kind of slow. It was kind of slow to to happen. And uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Because I know you were you've told me some things about your father and his relationship with um, <laughs> movers and shakers and politicians and. Mm -hmm. Congress people, and um, can you talk a little bit about how 
things that you knew were <coughs> happening to end the segregation? Yeah, for one thing, Henry B. Gonzalez was a very good statesman, and he and Dad worked together to accomplish a lot of this signs that were up as far as the colored and white, they were instrumental in having those signs taken down. Even on the federal government on the base, they had the signs taken down. So they were instrumental in, in a lot of this uh, freedom. And on the buses here, the city buses, above the driver, they had painted a sign, square sign, and it says white seats up front, white. So that was the that was the dividing line. You, you read that sign up there and you're supposed to sit toward the back of the bus. Okay. So eventually that came down that and But it wasn't they, just one day, correct? It no. was it was it took a, a period it, of it took a period of time. Just like, uh, like uh, the the movie theaters, that it just didn't happen overnight, but it did happen, and it was due to the fact that Henry B. and Dad fought for that equal rights, <coughs> and uh, well, the keyhole initially started the integration the people did themselves. A lot of people from the rodeo would come over and they were happy. I mean, you didn't have no humbugs as far as the race was concerned because in the nightclub, the keyhole, they had floor shows, so he had two showings a night, one at 11.30, one at one. And those were entertainers and they performed different things. You had singers, you had dancers, you had comedians. Uh, that, that, that was the gist of it all. And when uh, they were instrumental in making the city a more lenient deal and integrated, well, it, the people felt a lot better. Most people did. And uh, didn't have to worry about where you could go or you couldn't go. There were um, department stores. You mentioned Joski's before yeah. in our com Joski was known as the largest store in the largest state. That was the commercial. Uh huh. Then you had the Empire. So were were blacks allowed to go into Joski's uh, uh, before? Uh, they could go in there. Yeah, but as far as they could buy stuff, but they couldn't put any clothes to check the clothes or nothing like that. So after they had, after segregation was desegregated, they could go to these different places and try on clothes and whatnot. They could use the restrooms. And so you even had on military bases that uh, blacks couldn't yeah. go to certain places. So even military, even though you fought together, you worked together, Get everything right. together, um, you still had that. You had that, and that's why I say Henry B. and Dad were instrumental in having that desegregated. And at which Air Force base would that be? The Fort Sam, Kelly, Randolph, all the bases. They had to uh, heed by the new structure, the uh, elimination of blacks and, and whites and, and the job deal. And on the base. Um, well, oh, getting back to Dad, music uh, life. Sure. He had a bus they traveled in, a big Greyhound bus. Well, he started off with a small bus, and he traveled in different states. Then he graduated to a larger bus, and had all the band members, mother rode with him on the bus and then uh, he traveled, that's why he traveled all over the United States, Mexico and Canada. And he turned Ella Fitzgerald down 
from singing with his band at the time because it, it, it was segregated, but it wasn't because of that. He turned it on because she'd be the only lady on the bus. Beside your mother? Beside my mother. <laughs> so, and they have all these men and they're smoking weed then, they call it, they call it uh, weed. They're, they're a different name for it, but you could smell it real good. And uh, he had the different experiences he went through as he was traveling that time with the, which was integrated. It, it was segregated, and uh, he caught holy hell a lot of time with the band because they had to find places to stay. If they're going to play that night, a lot of places on the East Side and Denver Heights, when he booked some of the band members here, I mean, some of these one, time, one night stand. There was across the street from me, there was a house that had special rooms, individual rooms that they rented, and all down the street. And in this area, uh, a lot of the houses were like shotgun houses, due to the fact they were built for the people working on the railroad. And uh, that's why they were shotgun houses. Mm -hmm. And so many of them, and small streets, one block long, because where I live now, it had to be the, the blacksmith, because I crawled under the house way back, because the one part of the house I was having a problem with sinking, mm -hmm. and I got under there to shim it up, and he had a whole lot of cinders that, you know, from the coal, and I found horseshoes, I found the flat nails, so this was the main street at one time. This is, you're talking about your house here. Cherry Street. On Cherry Street. This area was geared up for the people working on the, on the trains. So it's very commercial. Yeah. Um, so thinking back on your life, um, can you talk about what you're the most proud of? That I'm here for all this length of time. I'm living. I may not be in the best of health, but I can still get around. I have my physic. I still have memory. Uh, I can remember a lot of things. Some things will blow my mind, but just living this long, to see all the changes that are being made every day, and uh, how the neighborhood has changed since I moved in this neighborhood. But what would you say has changed the most? Across the street, the fire department number one, the big one, it takes the whole block. And uh, on the other corner we had the funeral home, Sutton's funeral home, the Sutton's were well known in San Antonio. The Bellingers were well known, big shots. The old man Bellinger owned a lot of Conway Street. And, uh, Can you brothers. talk a little bit about Mr. Bellinger and his family? I didn't know the old man that, you know, I knew Velmo. And his father's name was Charles Bellinger, Charles, correct? Charles, yeah. Velmo had this newspaper called a Register, black newspaper. And they used to sell them in some of the stores. Some of the fellows would go to the houses and sell that. And after that, you had the snap by Eugene Coleman. He uh, did photography work in the keyhole. He uh, had an uh, uh, eating establishment right there on Hackberry and uh, um, Dawson. No. Hackberry and. Oh boy, I'm supposed to know that. But anyhow, the Bellingers were well known to the black neighborhoods, like Denver Heights, the East Side, and the West Side, and they were our voice at the time. They would 
informers in more or less cases who to vote for in certain voting deal. And so we'd follow them, whatever they said, we'd go along with that. And that did the community well? That was a that was good in your yeah yeah there was it was pretty good for us because it helped us to learn things about voting and who to vote for we could use our imagination they didn't inform us who they thought would be the best but we made the final decision and you remember St. Paul Square and this area right up the street and yes uh, I remember St. Paul Square in fact, um, St. Paul Square, you had, uh, that, that was commerce, you had black businesses there too. And then you had a drugstore, movie theater, cameo, you had uh, 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 eating establishment was for white only down at Conway's right by the railroad track, and I can't think of the name of that. He had a shoe shine boy on the outside. Uh, they don't know nothing about shoe shine nowadays. But, and uh, at this place on Commerce in the railroad track, blacks couldn't go in there. And they had a, they had a little, uh, on Sycamore Street was right around by the Cameo. Um, you could go around the back end and there was places you could go down there. And uh, it started opening different places down there. And then before you know it, the places were closing up because they couldn't make any money because they made commerce a one-way street. And that knocked the business off. People didn't know how to get there. Mm. Um, do you do you have any advice to give to uh, the younger generation? Don't be angry with everybody. Try to live a good life as long as you can, and don't try not to get in trouble. That's the main thing. Get your education and follow through on it. Mr. Kenneth Dominic. Uh, find, find your, find what's best for you and push on. Those are very good words to end the interview with and I, I'd like to thank Mr. Kenneth Dominic yes. for, for your time and for your uh, living history. All right. I, I, I think I'll remember some things after this is all over. I know. One time when Dad was trying with the bus and they were going to play this particular place at night and uh, they went to check it out where they were going to play. This, and the drummer set up the drums and whatnot because, you know, you, at that time you had to set up a bunch of drums. And uh, the drummer was quizzy. Wherever they are going to play, he'd go and check out the place. He went in one place, he opened the door and he closed it right quick and he went to call my, went to see my dad. And they called dad old man. Now dad was younger than that, but they called him old man. He said, old man, we can't play this gig tonight. Dad said, yes we are. He said, no, we can't play this gig. Dad said, why? He said, come out and show you. So when they walk in this building, he opened the door Nothing but Ku Klux Klan outfits and the, the hats, the robes. And so Dad said, you know, we don't usually take requests. Tonight we're taking requests. So that night, they did take requests. After they played, they got the money and they left. No humbug. But if they probably wouldn't have taken requests, <laughs> they probably would have had a whole lot of humbug. That's a great story. Yeah. That's a great story. And then Dad's, well, that bus, the brakes were built on pressure. 
you had to build up the pressure for brakes. So they had them in jail. They raided the place, they took them all down to jail. And I don't know why they raided the place. But then anyway, my grandfather had to move the bus. He traveled with mother one year on the bus. So he got there and started off and going up this incline and he tried to press on the brakes. There was no brakes. He got the rolling back. So the band members, I think, was on the bus at the time. So they got out there and started throwing rocks, whatever they could find under the back wheels to stop it. And it stopped right at the edge of this water. Like a, a little river there. And it stopped at the very edge. Part of it was in the water. And then they had to build up that pressure, then take off. And that's just some of the things, you know. And then, like, they had turned Ella Fitzgerald down. And uh, he, had, he had some pretty good... He had a fella called Al Hibbler Blind. He was a, he lived here, and he traveled with Dad one year or something. He sang with the band. He settled here, or oh, this was his home, and uh, I met him. And we went to we used to go to a movie. We went to the Cameo, which was a black movie theater on Commerce, and as the uh, People would appear on this in the picture. I'd tell them who they were and whatnot. And then when he come out, he could tell you the whole about the whole picture. Then he told me one time I saw him in the front and I was dressed up in my tailor made suit to match the band, the double breast. And I stopped to talk. I said, hey, Emma, how you doing? Hi, Count. Now he called me Count. I said, how you doing? I said, I'm doing, how you doing? Oh, okay. And uh, he said, uh, that's a pretty suit you have on. I said, hey, well, how the heck you know I got a pretty suit on? And he touched the fabric, and he told me what color it was. I can't believe it. I don't know how he could determine that, but he did there was another blind fellow that used to live around it, used to walk around the area one, and he could tell you about the coins. He could make change in the coin. And now he would cut some records, and he had a, a unusual voice. And when he would be singing, he'd say, uh, 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 well, uh, 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 that was in the, in the song. It would blend in with the song. And then, uh, I don't know what happened to him, but he made a couple, a couple of records that I heard some of them on the radio one time. But I don't have any of that. But I do have pictures of Dad's Keyhole Club. In fact, there's two of them. The one on the west side he built in 1950 when he moved back from New Orleans because they had moved to New Orleans to open a club over there. They thought it make more money. My dad's uncle convinced him to do that. But when they had that double shooting in the door because it took a long time for the paperwork to be signed, dad said cancel it. They moved back to San Antonio. And that's when he opened the keyhole on the west side. And the building still stands. But the one on the east side has been going, they bulldozed it completely. One on the west side is run by an organization, uh, a Spanish organization. And they have different things, quintanilla, weddings, birthday parties, uh, anything you want to rent the place for or lease it for so long. So it's still in operation. So that's called, we are referred to as Kio number two. And during that time that you're um, that you were helping your father out, he was working at Kelly Field, <clears throat> and he was running. He had a couple bands, or he had a. He was bringing in one night mm -hmm. band, one night acts. 
And you got to meet some celebrities, I would imagine. I uh, did. I met quite a few of them because they end up at the keyhole or at Dad's house. Dad would cook some meals and they'd over there come over there and eat. And where he learned how to cook, I don't know if I know. How in the world could he learn how to cook and he's traveling on the road? He's from New Orleans. With a, yeah, but he's on, he's on the road with a band. You know, this I don't understand, but I guess he just got gifted with learning how to cook and boy, when he cooked, he cooked every pot in the kitchen right there. That's another thing I'd do, clean up the pots and stuff. But the food was good. And he cooked, be cooking, and then everybody sit down to eat. And he'll say, hey, hey Don, aren't you gonna eat? I don't eat that stuff, he said. And he'd been eating all along, so he's full. But he said, I don't eat that stuff. <laughs> he, boy, he made some good casserole, gumbo, big dish, you know, not no little fried fish to you. But then, my sister was running for this Jaguar. It's a young, I think it's something I do with work as young ladies and she was on the phone taking orders or something, but she worked and she was running for Jaguar. So dad decided he's gonna fix plates and sell them to raise money. So he, he had oysters, shrimp, fish and you know you could order the combination or individuals and I would deliver and my sister won the Jabberwock they call it and then she's on the stage where he was playing a trumpet there one time that's at the the keyhole on the, on the west side she's on the stage and he's tooting the horn and She's dancing, but she never picked up any music instrument. I didn't, I played it. I was going to Douglas School Junior High on Hackberry, and I was taking lessons under Professor Hines. And Joseph Scott, a local fellow who made the song Honky Tonk famous, he made that record. With, for Bill Doggett's band. Well, it's Scott and I were taking music lessons together. Well, I graduated. I went to St. Peter Clavers, which is a Catholic school, and they didn't offer nothing but piano and violin. And I said, no, that isn't for me. So that's as far as my music went. No more. I, played. I played the records and the radio that's about it. Can you um, can you tell us about um, uh, briefly talking about the segregation? San Antonio is famous for its uh, hemisphere in 1968, which was, I believe, after segregation. I th I thought it was 64. I thought 1968. Well, I can you talk about? Um, your dad's band wanting to play at Hemisphere, and what happened? Yeah, well, Dad had a little band. He, some of the musicians was from his original band, and he had this band made up, and he's going to play in the Hemisphere, and they wouldn't let him play, because he had this the black band, so they called it, and uh, they 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 try to keep him out now, but. Jim Cullen Sr. was instrumental in getting Dad to play in the Hemisphere. And then they had the Battle of the Bands. Jim Sr. against Dad's band. I, I don't know how it turned out, I don't even know if they had judging, but it's just the idea that they had the bands playing, both bands. Mm. And that's how Dad got to play in, in the Hemisphere. So you had segregation slowly going away, and it sounded like your your father and and uh, I'm sure you were instrumental in slowly taking the signs down. 
Yeah, well, definitely Dad was mostly. Uh, I wasn't too involved in this. Uh, but I did, <laughs> you know, it's probably that damn, well, I'm sorry. But um, I, I didn't do anything to that extent. I went along with the program except for when I got on the bus. Oh, when I when I rode the what is it the streetcar in New Orleans? They used to have a sign, this stick on on the seat in front of you, and it had colored on one side and white on the other side. Well, you could pick it up and move it to the next one. And so I got on a bus with uh, his friend of mine, Kenfold, and. Uh, it said, uh, I could see the bus driver looking through his rear view mirror because I moved that sign and threw it on the seat in front of me. I said, what the hell is this damn thing? You know, I, I didn't, well, I played like I didn't know nothing about segregated, but I threw it on the seat in front of me. So finally he stopped the bus and he came, picked up the sign, he put it, put it up in front of me, say that belongs there. I said, why? I started getting a little boisterous, so I'm gonna get huffy puffy. So my cousin them kind of calmed me down, said, no, no, you know, let it go, let it go, you know, so it's, so that was my experience in fighting, I mean, involved in segregation and desegregation. The sign is gonna determine where you sit that made a lot of sense to me. You're going to sit in the same seats, same kind of seat. Wasn't nothing different about the seat. Uh, okay. On the train, down here at SP, they call it Southern Pacific at that time. It's just known as SP. Uh, we used to meet a lot of the entertainers coming in, like the people going to be on the floor show and whatnot. And I was right the car where it was right behind the engine and this coal burning engine. So, you know, consequently, there's a lot of sm soot, smoke. And at that time, everybody had their lunch, their lunch in bags, brown bags, fried chicken, boiled eggs mostly, because you, you couldn't eat on the train. So you had to bring it home. Then when they opened it up where you could go to the cafe, that was different, you know. It made a big difference. You could go in there and order different type of food. You didn't have to worry about segregation there. You could sit on most any way you wanted to. Well, I certainly appreciate your time. And uh, it's been wonderful to interview you. Oh, I appreciate it, Mark. <laughs>